sorry, can you hear me? Yes, sorry. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Rouse. Um, I can see there are 50 people at the moment in this uh, forum. Uh, so I'd rather um, hear some questions from them. Uh, personally, as, as I said earlier on, I work on US-China uh, competition. Uh, the reason why I'm personally interested in the UK is that um, US the US hegemony uh, could not possibly exist without alliances. And that's why it's so critical what is happening right now in the UK, in Italy, in Israel, in Australia, uh, with regard to the, the economy uh, security conundrum uh, and relations uh, with China. Um, so I would like to ask many, many questions, but there is many people listening to this webinar, so I wonder whether there are some questions, Michele? That, uh, that said, uh, Dr. Leone, thank you so much for this, uh, and uh, let me just very quickly thank uh, the panelists for this very interesting and thought-provoking discussion. Um, given, uh, as, uh, as Zeno was saying, the high number of participants, and once again, we thank you for that, Zeno, why don't you go ahead and maybe ask uh, um, uh, the initial question, and then should, uh, should anyone have any question, please use the chat to, to book your place, and then uh, I will moderate this, so that we're gonna make sure that everybody has an opportunity to ask uh, questions provided that, provided that they wanted. Many thanks. Okay, thank you, Michele. So uh, I won't ask anything related to uh, my research, but I'll stick to the, uh, the debate UK of uh, UK-China relations. Uh, my question would be, uh, it, it sounds like we're still far from, from a solution. So the, the, the process of developing a strategy towards China will take a while. Um, where do you think an answer will come from? Was the, was the inquiry, the report from, uh, from last year from the Foreign Affairs Committee any helpful in defining uh, the future of this relationship? Um, do you expect something from, the govern from this government, from the parliament? Uh, who has the answer to, to all this, really? Um, uh, Dr. Leone, I sense you're looking for an answer and um, uh, where wiser men hesitate to tread, let, let me charge in. Um, th there will be lots of views uh, in the run-up to the strategic and defence uh, reviews, the strategic reviews. Um, there is an, almost a competition at the moment amongst a relatively small number of Conservative MPs, no more than 50 at the most, as to who can write the, the sort of strongest anti-China article for the media this week. Um, uh, but the vast majority uh, of my colleagues realize that that isn't the number one issue of concern for their constituents and not necessarily in our best strategic interests as we seek to define global Britain. So there'll be a certain amount of noise around there and it's important that China understands that it is broadly noise, but underlying that are some of the statistics that uh, Kerry pointed to earlier, which is if you want to sort of do a vox pop of what people think about foreign countries, then China isn't top of the pops at the moment, and you wouldn't expect it to be at a time like this when the uh, a pandemic ha has caused mm. you know, huge hardship. Um, so where will it come from? Well, it will come from a combination of things, above all, a pragmatic government, uh, looking to do more business with the world, uh, looking at balancing uh, important free trade agreement uh, negotiations with America, uh, accession to the TPP, uh, a good deal with the EU, uh, which by the way is a perfectly uh, possible uh, and desirable, certainly desirable objective towards the end of the year, um, balancing negotiating those two things more or less at the same time with different teams is uh, going to be a testing juggling act, but, uh, but one that can be pulled off with a little bit of, uh, of clever negotiating and a bit of luck. Um, and uh, what I do think is important is that actually our nation as a whole builds up a bit more China capacity. And by that, I mean people in the National Security Council who've lived and worked in China People are able to understand and, and read the tea leaves just as they need to read our tea leaves. Uh, that sort of ability to, to understand and be able to reach out and hold 
long-term relationships um, is important. I think if you look at the last few years in both Australia and the UK, it would be a perfectly valid criticism of both countries to say that our approach to China has veered around slightly like a, a young driver after a night out on the road, um, swinging from side to side rather wildly. And we, we need to find a more settled balance in there. And that's perfectly possible. Thank you. Um, we don't have to strictly follow the, the order, but please. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so we have uh, Dr. Lisa McConnell would will, uh, will like to ask a question. So please, doctor, go ahead, uh, uh, unmute yourself, uh, and uh, uh, you can ask uh, your uh, interesting one. You. Hi, I think it's working. So I just had two questions, um, and I wrote them in the chat box it says what are the key elements to a framework for success as outlined by mr rouse and i'm sure um apologies for coming in late but i'm sure any of you can answer that on the panel and then secondly what concepts and discussions if we're having these and they're 10 years old how might we as democratized nations start where we are implement whatever best practices so we're no longer in the theoretical realm and what are the practical solutions for moving forward Thank you, Doctor. And any sorry, was the question addressed to Mr. Rouse? Okay, I can I can say something in response if you like. Um, at, a, at a at a pretty general level, I mean, this is primarily a political question. Um, if we're talking about how we frame a response, how we how we frame a uh, a strategy for success, you know, that that is going to come from political clear political leadership um, and I would suggest um, as Richard has mentioned in order to get good quality decision political decision making you need good knowledge of China we need to build up our knowledge of China very uh, significantly um, but uh, ultimately this will come from economic strength and then having a, a, a world beating industrial base that's building stuff that the rest of the, the world wants and you know, I'm not trying to pander to the audience here. I think uh, where the the West has uh, a huge amount to learn from China, it is when it comes to the importance of investing in education and technology, um, because China has done that in a very single-minded way for 34 years now, and and that's put them in a, a, a position of great strength. Um, but uh, I suppose the only other thing I would say is it can't just be a political. Um, decision for the politicians is very important. Of course, I would say, as the China-Britain Business Council, that the, the voice of business is heard. But it's also very important that all those people who've participated in people-to-people -people exchanges over the years, all those tourists, all those students, um, are able to uh, be represented there. And, and, and any successful China policy has to be not just about security and, and, uh, and commerce, but also about how you bind uh, China more closely um, uh, in through uh, cultural uh, exchanges because that's, you know, I think that is ultimately um, where uh, countries like the UK have very powerful assets to deploy. Many thanks, uh, uh, Mr. Rouse. Please, uh, Francesca Ghiretti, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you all for um, your contributions. I just have a very narrow question, uh, which is whether you believe that China currently in the US is perceived or viewed um, as a security threat. And if so, why is that? More precisely, which are the elements of this threat? Because um, it's very easy often to attribute, you know, to talk about something being perceived as a, a security threat. But at the end of the day, what I'm really struggling with is to pinpoint where this concern lies. I, my question is not really directly to any of you, so um, I don't know, I leave to the chair or to the speakers the decision to. I mean, I can, I can say, I mean, I can address that. And also the, the question before about the practical solutions. Um, and, and I mean, it's, <laughs> so I, I don't imagine what I'm about to say is gonna be very popular, but um, I suppose we have to just recognize the fact of China, you, you know, I mean, we have been uh, engaged, I suppose, since the 1980s um, in a sort of uh, a declining sort of battle of our ideals. Uh, and when I say our, I mean 
predominantly the United States and Europe, um, up to a point Australia, uh, and other liberal democratic nations, um, you call them enlightenment value nations if you want. I think, you know, there was always a sort of, there was a moment probably when we could have prosecuted a more um, sort of proactive, aggressive change on China, probably 1989. And that was the moment. And George W. H. Uh, w. Bush didn't. And, and I think people like Robert Ross and others have written about why he didn't. Um, and, and all of that makes sense why he didn't. However, that was the moment. Uh, the Communist Party of China, you know, was, was really kind of, I think it was wobbling and uh, kind of concerted action may have been able to bring about its ultimate demise, but that didn't happen. And I think really since then, you know, it's been kind of maintaining the idea that engagement uh, economically is going to lead to political outcomes with more and more evidence that's just not going to happen. Um, the variables in China are too complicated. The things that happened in the Soviet Union um, after 1991, obviously, well, all the things that happened in Russia after 1991 when the Soviet Union collapsed were a terrible advert. Um, so, uh, and also finally, Xi Jinping since 2002, I think 2012 has been, you know, the final kind of statement that China will not go along that path. And therefore, the practical solution, I suppose, is for us to sort of whack those ideals on the head and give up uh, a lot of the sort of notion that China is going to sort of, you know, become like us. That's never going to happen. Um, we have, uh, in fact, not really lived up to our ideals, I suppose, too. Um, and you know, we just need to critique ourselves also. I mean, there's other things that we could do about ourselves, but that's not what I'm talking about. I suppose, though, to accept China's role in the world is going to be not the one we expected and how we deal with that. That seems to me to uh, separate, you know, kind of um, accept a dual track world, not a bipolar world. Um, I'm not using bipolar, you know, I'm, when I say that, I'm talking about the Cold War, uh, Soviet Union in its own economic, political, and kind of its own discrete space, the rest of the world, you know, in their kind of space. Um, you know, that seems to me there was very little interaction economically in terms of capital flows and all the rest of it. That was a kind of neat world, really, uh, neat in terms of tidy, whereas now, you know, in all sorts of ways, China is in our space, and we're in China's space, so a dual track world means you know, really we're moving from a bungalow to a two-story house. And there's stairs. Most accidents happen on the stairs. You need those stairs and you're going to have accidents on those stairs, but you accept that there's this sort of, you know, benign division. And I think what it means is that you basically accept that there's going to be massive differences that cannot be resolved and that no one can resolve them. There's going to be a fragmented globalization. So global health, environmental issues, I think we can work together. Economic issues, ironically, after COVID-19, we're probably, like it or not, going to have to work together on. But other issues, we are definitely, definitely not going to be able to cooperate. Um, and, you know, that structure is something that we have to think about. I think it's going to either emerge whether we like it or it's going to emerge with our kind of, you know, structuring. But it's the kind of world that we see emerging. Um, and I think that sort of answers in a very roundabout way the second question too about the security threat um on the only security thing that i'll say so the security threat i, I mean to be honest the person who right so you very rarely hear this from a british person but i would advise you read a um french philosopher julian <laughs> uh, francois julian <laughs> um who wrote a book called a treatise on efficacy which is about um which is about uh, you know, the Chinese strategy. It's quite a short book. Um, and he writes, the strange thing about Chinese power is that it haunts, it doesn't act. It's passive. And that sounds a very weird thing to say. Uh, but when you think about it, China has not been involved in military activity beyond its border in terms of combat activity beyond its border, really, since 1979 and Vietnam. But, but that wasn't really very much, really, internationally since the Korean War. I mean, there's been sort of spats with India and there's been spats with, and there's been spats recently with India, but I mean, you know, not, not significantly. So it's got this massive military that just sort of sits there and is very passive. The South and East China Sea, I don't think, um, I mean, I think China sees those as domestic space and strategic space for itself. Um, so they don't really kind of count as outside the Chinese domestic space. 
And so that's a kind of weird thing that you've got this enormous military, you know, but it sort of has not until now done anything. Of course, um, it could change tomorrow. But the thing that is strange about Chinese power is it is powerful through being passive rather than being active. It kind of weighs psychologically on the world without doing anything. And, you know, Francois Julien really explains how that kind of has deep structures in, you know, kind of Chinese classical thinking um, and why it is different to the action orientated sort of Clausewitz view of the world. You know, I think it's really a helpful model because the spook, you know, the kind of, kind of weird thing about Chinese power is how spectral and sort of passive it is and how so far it's not sort of done the killer deed, um, you know, in terms of actual aggressive moves, except over its own domestic space. Thanks. Many, many thanks, uh, uh, Professor. Uh, um, Alex Bone, please go ahead. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you uh, to you both for organising today's event. Um, I think some of my questions just been covered slightly there by Professor Brown, Brown but I was thinking really, first of all, I'd, I'd also welcome um, the call for coherence across Whitehall in terms of formulating a UK strategy, which I think most of us can agree uh, has, has been lacking, and that, that, that's welcome. My thoughts are really sort of long-term out towards 2050, and you know, assuming it's too late to, to put this problem back into the box, and there is going to be a long-term strategic security challenge um, to the UK and to the Western liberal order, you know, what, what measures can we take to effectively deter uh, the, the threats as we might perceive them to be over the medium to long term? And I was looking back, thinking back to the Cold War, which we just briefly discussed there, and how block, you know, two blocks were formed. What's the panel's view in terms of what blocks might form, either two or more, uh, noting the position of Russia and India? And what does that mean for the UK right now? And does it look ahead in terms of the integrated review that's coming up uh, later in the year? Um, with a particular reference perhaps to how we can deter over the longer term. And finally, a thought really on what the UK's position, along with Australia, on how it might influence uh, the UK's closest security partner, the USA, over the short to medium term to kind of come up with a more coherent international view towards China. Thank you. Thank you. Any, any, any takers? Well, yeah, I guess somebody should should try and um, answer at least parts parts of those questions. Look, I mean, I think the most important thing from Britain's point of view is um, I don't personally want us to do anything that ends up in having two very polarized views of the world and two sort of blocks in a sort of new humid war. Um, um, using humid to contrast with sort of cold. Um, I, I just don't see that as something that's, that's helpful for the world, um, for the younger generations, for global peace, their opportunities, or anything else. And uh, so therefore the responsibility of the UK, as so often in these situations, is to work closely with our, our oldest and closest allies in trying to um, avoid precisely the division which the previous contributor, I think he was called Alex, uh, was sort of conjuring up. And a good example of that in a sense would be the creation of the, uh, the AIIB, the Infrastructure Investment Bank in Beijing, which we made a, a very clear decision to be the first major Western country to join, contributing our capital to its efforts. Um, that was initially deplored by America, disapproved of by one or two others, including I think Germany at the time. And actually later on, in retrospect, quite a few Americans have said to me privately, it was the right thing for us to have done. And so, you know, there is a sense in which we have to keep these lines of communication and dialogue open. Um, and in a way, the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, if one wants to use that as an example of how China could be building lots of bridges across the world, both to her own and to the world's advantage, is an example of a bit of a missed opportunity so far. Because the truth is, the name is, is not a good name. Uh, the brand is not very strong. The results are not very convincing. The customers are not very happy. Western cooperation has been patchy, 
And it's not really a great advert for the sort of global success that Xi Jinping and China are looking for. And that follows on another slightly half cock initiative, which was the free trade zone in Shanghai. And so although um, you know, some people can make the case, and there are lots of people in China to make it, that this is a powerful nationalist, China knows the answers type country, we can dominate the world. Mm. The truth is actually they're better when they try and work with the world. And many of them know that privately. And that has to be the contribution of Britain to try and involve the Chinese more, use our areas of expertise to help them. And then we can avoid these great divides and a sort of new humid war between two blocks of the world. Um, you know, as if it was a, one of those sort of ghastly board games that people are playing during the pandemic lockdown. Let, let me come in and, and say something in agreement on that fundamentally. I mean, these are, these are big questions gaze, gazing towards 2050. And I, I lead a very humble business organization that doesn't really engage uh, with such mighty perspectives. Um, do I think uh, economic engagement is, you know, it's, it's grand purpose is to convert China to liberal democracy? No, I don't. You know, I don't put my faith in capitalism. I put my, put my faith more in... Um, uh, well, chaos theory, really, you know, change and entropy are the, are the natural states of the universe. And in, not so long ago, and when I was born, we were worrying that the Soviet Union was going to take over the world. And then in the 70s, we were worried the Arabs were going to buy the world. And then it was the Japanese. And now, lo and behold, it's the Chinese. Uh, and funnily enough, the Soviets and the, the Arabs and the Japanese never did actually uh, take over the world. And I don't think China will either. Um, what 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 should our response be to ri rising Chinese power? Well, uh, I don't believe in uh, disengagement and decoupling and bifurcation of the world, as I hope I've made clear. I think Deng Xiaoping had a, had a point, and I think we should bide our time and build our strength and think about you know what makes uh, Britain strong and what are the areas in the West that give us a capacity competitive uh, 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 advantage and a lot of that does come from our political values and our ideologies uh, and in the meantime please can I make a plea for evidence-based policy and on the, on the great Huawei question of our day uh, you know, a lot of money has gone into procuring expensive research uh, at uh, the cyber security evaluation cell uh, at uh, Banbury you know paid for by Huawei yes but uh, carried out by personnel from GCHQ. You know, these are um, independent experts of great uh, integrity who recommend that um, uh, Chinese technology can be brought into uh, the UK's uh, non-core critical national infrastructure in a way that allows risks to be man managed. So you know, let's use that data. Let's base our approach on... Uh, uh, evidence uh, and be smart in the way that we uh, engage because this is going to be a very dynamic fast changing picture um, and most of all you know let's do it with confidence that uh, our societies in the West are places where people want to live uh, where people uh, want to engage and that we have a great deal to uh, offered to China as she goes through this great process of, uh, of standing up. I mean, I mean, I, um, just a couple of things. I, mean, I think, I think Matthew is right in, um, this idea of, of sort of, uh, you know, kind of letting things take time. I mean, the thing about the 2050 date, I think in China, it's the 2040, 49, isn't it? That's the second centennial goal, the celebration of the, People's Republic of China's centennial, and they, I think under Xi Jinping, it's been about you know kind of China's creating um, you know democracy with Chinese characteristics, and everyone sort of laughs at this. And I guess you know the assumption is that Chinese democracy with Chinese characteristics will still be a one-party entity. But I mean, I guess the most you can say is that I can't really see the China of today um, being that similar to to the China of 2049. I mean, I think there's going to be very radical change. And, um, you know, that's because the China of 1989 was so different to the China of today or even 1990. Uh, uh, yeah, 1989, um, you know, so, so that's 30 years ago. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, 30 years time, um, 
there's going to be change, right? But we don't know what kind. So I think we do have to play for time. And um, while it sounds dramatic to talk about a dual track world, I guess it just means managing the boundaries better. I mean, there do have to be boundaries, right? Clearly, there has to be boundaries. Not, not, not in certain areas where there can't be boundaries, but in areas in which we can't agree. And it's clear that China isn't going to agree. Um, you know, we just have to sort of manage that tension. Um, so it's going to be a golden age for diplomats. Uh, you know, they're going to be the ones that are going to be busy doing that. Um, but it does mean that, you know, we have to recognize those boundaries are there um, and have to have some part of kind of trying to set them up. The Fusidides trap, I don't think applies to this. I think it's slightly different to the Soviet Union or, or Japan. Or I mean, Japan shared democratic values, so that wasn't quite as difficult. Um, uh, the, the Arab world, for sure. But, the, I mean, you know, even the Soviet Union at the peak was, I think, 69% of the size of the American economy. And China is creeping beyond that now. And, you know, this sort of argument is as it gets to sort of the same size as the American economy and then surpasses it, well, we're in unknown territory. And it's, um, it just doesn't, you know, sort of, it's, it's kind of uh, a different sort. I, th I, think, I do think it is a different kind of challenge and a very unique kind of challenge. Um, but, I mean, to try and define that is really, really hard. That's why, you know, it's not like the USSR. You can be very clear about the ideological and other reasons why the USSR was the China, China kind of challenge it was, whereas China is, is I think, a slightly different, well, a very different challenge. Um, I think the final thing, why play for time? Um, the variable, so, so there are two variables, I think, that are going to kind of resolve this to make the dual track world more singular again. One is environmental issues. If the scientists are right, uh, we will be facing things that transcend boundaries way beyond anything that we're going to be able to deal with. And I think that will be the big leveler. So COVID-19 has leveled, you know, in many ways. It's shown that democracies and non-democracies are really ineffective at face, facing these kind of issues. But it's also encouraged a lot of cooperation between scientists, which well, look, I mean, if a kind of Chinese and, and a European and American group of scientists create a vaccine, what an amazing symbol that will be, you know, and, and it's possible, it's possible. Um, so environmental issues in the next 30 years. And then uh, the other variable is the role of the middle class in China and, you know, what that will mean. Because I'm not saying that they're going to, I've been mean, completely not saying that these are going to be, you know, great democratic kind of actors but I don't think that they're going to be um, easy actors for the Communist Party too. I mean, you know, that's the interesting dynamic. And I think that they're going to be a challenge both for the Communist Party of China and for us <laughs> in a strange way. And I suspect um, that the things that they may want will be kind of things that, you know, European and American uh, companies and entities might be able to play a role in, you know, increasing consumption in China, that's the big sort of thing. Well, I don't really see that's very easy without the kind of services and sort of, you know, the sorts of intellectual things where I guess, you know, Europe and America are still, you know, kind of, they've still got the edge. So I think the middle class is the great variable in environment would be the great variable. And I would structure policy over the 30 years in looking at those areas, I think, because they, they're clearly sort of the givens. Um, other things are less clear, but those two are, I think, pretty pretty clear. Many many thanks, all. We, uh, we are running maybe a little bit out of, out of time, but we still have time for one more question. So please, uh, uh, Juan Martin, go ahead. Juan, are you are you there? Uh, wait, 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 because I cannot, uh, we cannot hear you, but uh, uh, you, you have to uh, unmute yourself. That, there, there we go. Uh, can, uh, we we cannot, can just, yeah. We cannot, uh, Juan, listen, uh, for whatever reason, we cannot hear you, but uh, I can just read your question aloud. Uh, 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 if, uh, if it is okay with you. So uh, Juan was asking, uh, what is the panel's views uh, on the latest declarations of the EU High Representative of, of the Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy 
Joseph Borrell, uh, asking for a more robust EU strategy towards China because the pandemic could imply a change in balance of power. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Juan. Uh, do you want, I mean, so I, I, I don't want my other colleagues to suffer too much. So I, I'm an academic, so I can, I can, I can, you know, do my do my civic duty and and claim my claim <laughs> my drink at the pub one day when things ease up. You know. All right. I, I mean, um, I don't want. I mean, so the amount of thinking that the EU has done on China in the last. Um, say 20 years has been significant and uh, in 2006 there was one set of in, you know kind of um, uh, uh, sort of communications about you know kind of helping China in its domestic reform which was really kind of like Europe saying to China we're here to help you know and, and in 2016 uh, there was a sort of follow-up set of communications which were longer and much more about what um, you know kind of uh, Europe needed from China investment, you know, kind of better quality partnership, and and I still think that's a good framework. I mean, that clearly needs to be revised. Um, but you know, it, it seemed to me that Europe was saying, okay, we we want to see pragmatic outcomes in terms of you know, kind of in, inward investment and uh, you know, kind of things that we're going to kind of create jobs and and all of the sort of you know practical sort of issues rather than being being too idealistic um i mean you know broadly broadly and i think um it's fine for uh, you know europe to say now uh, that covid19 has clearly re re really sort of changed you know some of the dynamics with china um but but the old issues don't go away um there's still obviously very div big differences in approach between for instance greece which is relatively benign towards china i mean really really you know kind of friendly um, and Italy, which signed obviously the MOU, though it was not particularly detailed on the Belt and Road, um, and you know, kind of others, I suppose that sat more in the middle, more pragmatic, uh, Germany, France, and then if you look at the Czech Republic, now it's got a very brittle and difficult relationship with China. You know, it's a classic case of how things can go badly wrong. Um, so and that's a hard spectrum to try and cover. Um, I suspect it's no different from the case of the you know, UK. Uh, the economy will decide this as there's an imperative to create jobs and growth. Europe will need to clearly adapt uh, its sort of position, to, depending on you know, if, it, if it manages to get out of the economic crisis um, that's kind of coming or already come um, without you know, sort of really, really kind of dealing more with China, fine. But I mean, if it's really kind of, you know, in, in it looks like it will be in the same kind of mess as most others, um, then I mean, it's got to kind of keep sight of that. Uh, to sort of come back to the thing I said at the beginning, the strategic choice is very simple, particularly now, you have a choice between saying to the world's second biggest economy, um, we just can't do it. We can't engage with you more. Sorry, you know, we just can't do it. And we'll take the costs. Or you have to say, we will deal with you and we'll take the costs. <laughs> but both mean costs. And I think as politicians, you know, and leaders um, in Europe, and Boris Johnson here, obviously, um, that are going to have to basically spell that out. Uh, they've got to take leadership, otherwise the public views will take precedence, and that could be pretty disastrous, because they're very mixed and very, very kind of, you know, volatile, and there'll be no consistency, you know, just because of the complexity of, of, of public views on China. So politicians are going to have to show leadership, yeah. Um, Dr. Lely, uh, the, the, that was very interesting and useful. Can I just make a very quick uh, contribution to this one? I think um, uh, Juan Martin's uh, question, I think the way probably to look at it is look at some of the, to my mind, rather uh, maladroit efforts of some of China's diplomats in Europe recently. They've had major arguments uh, with the editor of the, the Bild in Germany. Uh, there's been a major argument with Sweden, the government as well. And as Kerry uh, observed, a uh, bust up with the Czech Republic as well. And I think one of the things that this shows is a bit of a challenge for China, which is greater suppleness in how it engages with the world greater understanding that as you become more and more important as a world superpower, you're going to be more and more criticized, and that comes with the territory, and you're going to have to learn to live with that. 
and uh, its representatives need to do more to build bridges rather than to create divisions and arguments. And uh, in this sense, actually, the UK no longer being part of the European Union may be an advantage for both. I, we will still have very close relationships, particularly on the security side with our European neighbours. There is no question of that. Do not mistake anything Boris says for being anti-Europe. It might be anti the European Union, but it is not anti-Europe. But at the same time, we will enjoy a greater freedom to be able to have our own foreign policy with China and have links over there, which could be beneficial to both again, because there is not a great deal of China experience in uh, several of the European countries. And uh, there is real potential for those relationships to go badly wrong. And one last thought, which you know, I do think China needs to mull over a bit. It's all very well cozying up to any individual country uh, with sort of donations of PPE, uh, investments in strategic assets like ports and so on. And for the government in power, that may be very attractive. But when it comes to elections, we've seen time and time and again, and we saw it in Malaysia and we saw it in Indonesia, that actually being very cosy with China is not necessarily an electoral winner. So there is going to have to be a balance in this relationship, as I was indicating earlier. It's not, it cannot be one or the other. It cannot be pro-China or anti-China. The EU will have to have a relationship with China. Individual countries will have to have a relationship. And those will go up and down like the relationships uh, do uh, even with your closest partner, your your wife, husband, or, or other spouse. You know, these things are going to happen. And so the key thing here is that what uh, the EU has signaled here is this concern about a more robust strategy, because that reflects what electorates are thinking. And China is going to have to think about how it responds, but it doesn't need to be too sensitive about it, in my view. Uh, I'll say one very brief <laughs> final remark, if I may. Um, I don't disagree uh, with uh, Kerry or Richard on this. Yes, of course, there are costs. Uh, but I would simply make the point that this is not just about the projection of power in some kind of zero-sum competition. There are common global challenges. And there is no big question out there in the world today that can be solved uh, without engaging China. Um, you know, we, we work very closely as the West with China on medical issues like antimicrobial resistance, piracy in the Horn of Africa, you know, huge amount going on there, uh, and climate change is the biggie. I mean, we should really have spent a lot more time today talking about the environmental challenges. China is the leader in renewables technology. Unquestionably, China is the leader in uh, electric vehicles, offshore wind, um, we need to use that engagement profitably to ensure that we come up with better solutions together to um, the shared problems of humanity. So, uh, it's as um, simple as that. Thank um, you. Oh, all right. Th thank you all. Thank you very much. I think it's also uh, important to uh, stick to the time, also for the speakers, but also for uh, those who are in the audience. Um, I couldn't, I couldn't add anything um, more interesting than what has already been said. So I just wanted to end with a, maybe with a funnier note. Uh, I've been trying to, uh, we've been trying to organize this uh, since uh, November, that, but then the snap election got in the way, then Christmas, Brexit, then COVID. Uh, but the solution was always there under our eyes. It was the internet. So I wonder, where, may wonder whether there probably is a, a solution uh, under our eyes with regard to uh, China. But of course, I think there is, a, there is a big lesson for those who are interested in strategy. And, and I know many people who get involved or are, or are interested in strategy. Um, strategy is something that is long term. And certainly, we have been overlooking uh, China for many years because we were more focused on um, what is called order building, the, the building of the international order, the war on terror, Russia, uh, Brexit. Um, uh, yeah, so I guess that's, that's certainly a, a lesson to, to carry for strategy makers to, to, carry with, to carry with them for the future. Uh, you need to think long term always. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Graham, Professor Brown, Mr. Rouse, Thanks a lot. Thanks for your time.
and thanks for those 50 people who are there and who have been listening to us uh, on, on such a beautiful day, sunny day. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well thanks so much. Thanks. <laughs>